Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We're very excited to have John Stout uh, here to tell us today about reigning in rampant instanton expansions, uh, which sounds like some sort of a, a tongue twister in some way. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to find an alliterative aspect to a title. So. Um, wh whenever you're ready, John, take it away. <laughs> uh, so th thanks very much for the invitation. Um, uh, so whenever I give a talk, I like to like just tell you exactly what it's about and what the point is. Um, and so the main question uh, that I want to answer is like, what's happening when we lose control of an axion's axion potentials, instanton expansion? There's this common like trope in uh, both string theory and high energy physics where um, we try and tune a parameter and lose control over the theory. And whenever we lose control over an instanton expansion, it's not quite clear what's happening in the theory. We're losing control over the description, but what I'd like to understand, and the goal of this talk is to understand what happens when we lose control over an instanton expansion. Like what, what's the physical cause at, it, at its base? Um, and so the, the main point of this talk and the thing that I'll try and convince you of is, that we lose control of over the instanton expansion because there, there's a phase transition that happens somewhere around the axion's field space. You know, there, there can be light states that appear somewhere along the axion's field space, and those light states force this non-convergence. It forces us to lose control over the instanton expansion. So instead of phrasing this process in terms of something that has a fairly sometimes dubious physical interpretation, like an instanton, we can phrase it directly in terms of something that has a well-defined interpretation in the Hilbert space, the mass or the energy of some state. Right? So, and the side effect of that is we'll be able to find uh, a way of describing the effective potential, um, the axion's effective potential, uh, in this limit where we've lost control over the instanton expansion, but we'll be able to describe it in a fairly simple way. So the, this is based on work that came out, I guess, two months ago um, at the middle of December. Um, and the plan, overall plan of the talk is, I'll give some motivation for why this is an interesting question, the why I got interested in it. And then I'll, I'll talk about the relationship between Fourier series and phase transitions. How can we, uh, how phase transitions or the appearance of light states are related to the convergence of Fourier series expansions. And then I'll illustrate this in a couple toy models. And then finally, I'll conclude. So, um, for the entirety of this talk, what I'll focus on is the theory of a single axiom. And it's two, deriv two derivative effective Lagrangian looks like this, you have some kinetic term and some effective potential, some potential for the axiom, which I'll call the effective potential. And the one of the defining features, maybe the defining feature of an axiom is that it's a compact scalar, uh, compact pseudo scalar, I guess, but it is compact with a field space circumference of two pi f, where f is called the axiom decay constant. And throughout this talk, I'm going to alternate between uh, this var phi, which is, uh, and theta, which is two pi periodic, just by rescaling off the axion decay constant. It'll be a little more convenient to work with theta often, uh, just not to have all of these uh, factors of f floating around. So the, the, the main object of interest for this talk is, is this thing called the effective potentials. This potential that has to be has to fit on the axion's field space, it has to be two pi periodic because it has to be single value. Um, and what this effective potential is, is it's a potential that's usually generated by non-perturbative effects. So sch schematically, like whenever I think about this in my, my head, I'm, I'm thinking of phi, the axion being coupled to some other theory, some like a gauge field or some, you know, gravitational fields or some string fields. That whose instantons generate a potential for phi. So if I integrate out like this gauge field A with this coupling to the axion, 
you know, there's going to be instantons in that theory whose behavior is going to depend on the properties of the gauge field and the charge matter in the theory. And whatever this does, because of the fundamental periodicity of the axion, those gauge theory instantons are going to generate a periodic potential for horophon for the axion. And so what we're going to do is we're going to think of the effective potential as being the ground state energy of the theory in the presence of some constant axion profile, some constant theta profile. And because it's periodic, we can necessarily decompose it into its Fourier coefficients. And what we're going to do is be very interested in the convergence of the series and what dictates that convergence, because that will uh, end up having uh, be interesting, both phenomenologically and theoretically. So I've only included like factors of the temperature or the, the Euclidean time interval, uh, space-time volume, and theta. But in the back of my head and in, in the back of your heads, you should imagine that there are other constants, other parameters of the theory that we can tune and change the, the properties of this, the, these coefficients. So we can change the theory that we're integrating out and get a different effective potential. And the Fourier coefficients will reflect that dependence. Okay. So just to give kind of a schematic picture for this motivate as a motivating, uh, to motivate this, this talk, um, first we, we want to understand roughly like a toy picture of how these effective potentials are computed in the presence of like these gauge theory instantons. And you know if you if you open Coleman's book and read about instantons, read about these these potentials, uh, you, you'll find that you these are computed in like this dilute instanton gas approximation. So what I do is I have a bunch of uh, blue instanton, no, uh, red instantons and blue anti-instantons. And each of these, these instantons are semi-classical or they're classical, semi-classical saddles to the Euclidean equations of motion. So this path integral that we use to extract the effective potential is dominated by these semi-classical saddles. We decompose this path integral into a sum of, over those saddles. And each instanton or anti-instanton has some uh, action associated to it, which I've called S1. Every time I tunnel, every time I have an instanton or anti-instanton, I get a phase. I weight them by a two pi i theta times their uh, instanton number. And then I have this, this counting factor. So I, I consider just taking my path integral and then sprinkling instanton and, and anti-instantons over the entire path integral. And I sum up over all the different ways I can do that. So I have to include these, these counting factors that I get because they're indistinguishable. And then when I do, do this dilute instanton gas approximation, they all sum up and exponentiate and I get this nice cosinusoidal potential. So this is in the single instanton approximation where I've only considered these things as non-interacting events. But then when I include interactions between them and then I include different, uh, the different properties about these instantons, I include bi-instantons and tri-instantons and instanton molecules. I'll get an effective potential that's roughly of this form. You know, it's the sum over cosines, uh, where each Fourier harmonic of this the sum is suppressed by uh, is exponentially suppressed. Okay, and then there are these coefficients that depend on cooperation integrals and all this stuff. But you know, the rough idea is that whenever I have an axion effective potential or effective potential for an axion, it takes this, this schematic form of exponentially suppressed cosines. And so the, the standard story is that as long as the single instanton action is large, then we expect that the 
buy instanton action is tw roughly twice that, you know, try instanton is thrice that and so forth, then we can just truncate this and we have an effective potential that's just a single cosine. You know, it's a pure cosine of solenoid thing. And you can argue um, that this form is robust to radiative and gravitational corrections. Essentially, like as long as the instanton action is uh, large, then you, you can renormalize this this scale out in front. You can renormalize the axiom decay constant, but otherwise, like it's just there's only one thing it can be. And so this presents a problem um, because this effective potential is breaking a continuous shift symmetry. And we expect that if I try and embed this continuous shift symmetry into a quantum gravitational theory, then I should get these terms that are suppressed by M Planck, the quantum gravity. Quantum gravity should break this continuous shift symmetry by terms that are associated with the scale of quantum gravity, i.e. M Planck. And if I can take the axiom decay constant to be much larger than M Planck, then I have a bunch of unnaturally small Wilson coefficients. So I can engineer a very large hierarchy by relying on uh, large instanton actions and large axiom decay constants. So, you know, this, is, this presents conflict within us because we kind of believe this, this, you know, it's hard to engineer large hierarchies. It's especially hard to engineer them in quantum gravity. And so what we want to do is we want to understand whether we can keep, take F, the axiom decay constant to be vastly super Planckian while keeping this truncated form around. So, like I said, this is interesting because, you know, a lot of these models are um, large field inflationary models. That's kind of why they were um, hot maybe a couple of years ago. But, you know, at the very core, they're useful for studying the nature of large hierarchies in quantum gravity. And so that's, that's, I think, the main motivating factor for, one of the main motivating factors for under, studying them. And generally these axion models are just phenomenologically very hot right now. And so it's useful to understand exactly how these potentials behave and you know, all their different knobs and stuff. Sorry, John, can I, can I ask yeah. you a quick question? About, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, in your previous slide, uh, if you can go back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. This one? Yeah, this one. So, so normally in the context of a strong CP problem, uh, the fact that the quantum gravity induced term can be like, can mess up with the uh, instant induced potential is a phrase as a quality, you won't call it yeah. a problem, right? Yeah. Now, but then your goal seems to be different in the sense that you want to engineer such that uh, Planck suppressed term is suppressed just because F is much, much larger than M Planck. Yeah. Right. And then, and then uh, you rely on what the uh, instanton based computation, or so I, I lost the last part of the logic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. So, so I would say that that the axiom quality problem is that you expect not just that you get these in Planck suppressed terms, but right. that they shift the the minimum of the potential exactly a little bit away. Uh -huh. But I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that you know. Let's ignore whether let's ignore instanton phases for the moment and ignore that different corrections could possibly have different minima and stuff. Mm -hmm. If I'm just trying to engineer a large hierarchy in quantum gravity, I can do so with potentials of this form just by taking the axiom decay constant to be very super Planckian. And so if if I want to study hierarchies in quantum gravity, these axionic theories are a very useful place to do so because I, I can ignore a bunch of perturbative corrections to this form. Uh -huh. I, I know that as long as I can ensure this very large instanton action, then the potential has to take this form. And then if, I, if the potential takes that form, then I can engineer 
very small Wilson coefficients by taking f to be vastly super Planckian. Okay. So, that, that, so this is not um, uh, the crux of the talk, but just a way of of motivating that you know these types of theories are interesting, and there presents a pro there presents a conceptual like perhaps. Uh, there, there's an interesting conceptual aspect to this when I try and take F to be very super Planckian. Okay, thanks. Because we expect that that's a problematic limit because we expect that it's hard to get, it's hard to win, right? It, there's, it's hard to, to uh, yeah, it's hard to engineer large hierarchies in general. That's why there are hierarchy problems. And if, we can do that essentially for free, then we should understand whether that's, that's possible. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like it's possible in quantum gravity. So like if you, if you try and construct vastly super Planckian decay constants in string examples, you always find that um, the action of these instantons will shrink as I, as I uh, take F to go to, get much larger than in Planck. So what fails in this, this chain is this assumption. It seems very difficult to keep the axiom decay constant to be much less than one and keep, sorry, keep the instanton action to be much greater than one while keeping the axiom decay constant much larger than in Planck. So, you know, this is, this is the core like, uh, observation of this paper by Banks, Stein, Gorbachev, and Fox is that in examples where you try and realize these vastly super Planckian decay constants, you always run into two things. You run into an action that shrinks to zero, and so you lose control of the instanton expansion. I have to sum up an uh, infinite or a very large number of terms in this potential to figure out what it's saying. Or I get some light sticks that appear. Um, and so, you know, there's this picture of that as I take F to be much larger than Planck, if F is smaller than in Planck, then I have these like well localized instantons in this approximation, this writing it in this form is a good idea because the action of these classical saddles gives me a very good idea of what the potential looks like. I only need to find one and I have a very good approximation to the potential. But in this alternative limit, in this interesting limit where I'm supposedly able to engineer a very large hierarchy, this, this picture breaks down. I have, I've lost control over this, this uh, approximation. I'm working with these very large instantons that probably usually overlap and there's a very, it's very difficult to go from these instanton actions into the actual form of the potential. There's not like a, a simple map. So these, these, it's no longer a very informative way of phrasing this problem. Okay. So this, this was reformulated as a conjecture on quantum gravitational theories in, in terms of the axionic weak gravity conjecture. Which basically says that the action of the instantons has to go to zero as I take F to go to M Planck. So sorry, F to go get much larger than M Planck. And so in this interesting limit of very large axiom decay constants, I always lose control over the instanton expansion. And, and the question, the main goal of this, the main motivating factor in this talk, and the main goal of this talk is to understand what exactly does that mean? Because if I'm, I have some quantum gravitational constraint on instanton actions, and then the interesting limit where the axiom decay constant gets much larger than in Planck, this, this bound doesn't really translate to anything about the potential. It, it, it gives me a bound on something that doesn't really have a very strong physical interpretation because I have to sum up over all of them. I have to include interactions. I have to do all of this stuff. And it's very confusing what this is actually bounding in this interesting limit. And it's also confusing in the sense that this is supposed to 
restrict our ability to restore some some continuous global symmetry. And then the F goes to infinity limit. I'm restoring a continuous shift symmetry. If this is if this works, then it should actually restrict our ability. It, quantum gravity should fight back in some way when we try and restore this continuous shift symmetry. And I think an interesting question, and one of the main motivating questions for this, this work is to understand, is this constraint or is something like this actually successful in restricting our ability to realize some continuous shift symmetry? Yeah. So really trying to probe an edge of quantum gravitational theories and understand if this is consistent or does it need to be strengthened? So do we need to impose additional constraints on uh, quantum gravitational theories so that uh, it's impossible to restore this continuous shift symmetry? Oh, sorry, can, can yeah. I ask another very quick thing? Yeah. So are you thinking F as, uh, as, uh, as one genuine scale or uh, somehow you can generate engineer F being much larger than M Planck because of some other, other parametrical dependence of the theory, meaning like some power law enhancement compared to the scale, which is still sub Planckian, but nonetheless F happens to be ah. super Planckian. Which way are you thinking right now? So, so uh, usually that's, yeah, so I'm, I'm only working in the context of a single axion theory. So I'm kind of, it, it could be some like effective axion decay constant that is vastly super Planckian. And there's been a lot of work in like actually trying to, to have a well-defined notion of what an axion decay constant means in multi-axion theories where you can get this parametric enhancement. Right. But from the, the purposes of this talk, I'm just thinking there's some parameter that I'm tuning and I want to understand if I tune that parameter so that the instanton expansion fails or I lose control over the instanton expansion, what does that mean? Right? Because at, at the very like base level, even if I have the ability to turn that knob in the theory and drive this, this expansion out of control, I still don't actually know what is happening because you know, <laughs> there are lots of, Fourier expansions that are very, very well behaved, but don't have this exponential suppression. Right, but then, <laughs> sorry. The, the, one of the reasons I, I asked that question was because if you view F as a genuinely like super Planckian actual dynamical scale, but then can you have this question as a factorizable question in the sense that you know to really talk about instant calculation scale around the F, Look, looks like you have to figure out first the quantum gravity thing. And then how did you know the filter calculation is not completely like deformed or, or modified yeah, by yeah. quantum gravity effect at all to be yeah. so, to begin with? Yeah, so, so the, the goal is to phrase things in a general enough way, just at the level of partition functions. Oh, okay. So that we can draw some, um, lessons from what this means and hopefully have a way of of um, translating that into a quantum gravitational thing right because okay. in, in some sense we want to figure out what the right question is to ask right right exactly. and, right. and and in order to do that uh if you don't understand that question in, in field theory then mm -hmm. It's right. yes. bad news for the quantum gravitational case. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No. If if anyone has any questions, please ask because it's you know the the Zoom talk. It's hard to gauge whether people are uh, whether I'm, what I'm saying is is sparking joy or not. Um, so so another way of of asking this is you know what what goes wrong when this instanton expansion fails. Does the potential actually become rough? It's the general idea is that as I take F to go to be very, very super Planckian, you know, the if I can keep this instanton action to be very large, then the potential is relatively smooth. And so I can stretch out that potential 
you have a very, very tiny breaking of the continuous shift symmetry. The way that the picture that people have and the way that quantum gravity responds is just by introducing many, many more harmonics. And so this creates some structure on scales that are less than in Planck. And so the continuous shift symmetry is, is broken by those by effects of that order. And so we want to understand in this limit, does this condition actually require that we have this jagged structure? Or does it, is there a way of, of strengthening this condition so that it does? Okay. So a lot of this, this came from this, this idea that like anytime I have a sum, I can use Poisson resummation to re-express that sum. I can take this, this function and re the summoned and replace it with a sum over it's Fourier transform. And you know, just from if this summons is very delocalized and very, you know, very non-convergent, wave particle duality essentially tells me that this Fourier expansion is going to be very sharp. This Fourier transform is going to be very sharp. And so I can take this very non-convergent sum and re-express it in a very convergent way. And so, you know, there's a easy way of getting an approximation to this, this very non-convergent sum just by replacing it with its Fourier transform. Like in this case, if S goes to zero, I have to include tons and tons and tons of terms. But in that limit, this sum becomes very useful because it's, you're essentially just dominated by this, this big Lorentzian peak. And so I can truncate this when this, if I can't truncate this, I can truncate this and vice versa. Right. So uh, another way of asking this question is I can do, this is just a generic math fact. I can always re-express the sum in terms of its Poisson resummation, regardless of whether or not I can actually compute this Fourier transform. The question is, is there a, some physical information? What physics information uh, governs this resum form? Because ideally, if this instanton expansion is failing, we just go to the Poisson resum form and use that. So is there a physical question that I can ask of the theory that tells me what this function should look like? Okay. Is, is the motivation clear? Um, I want to understand what it means when an instanton expansion fails, because that is an uh, interesting limit. Uh, that, that happens in interesting limits of these quantum gravitational theories. OK. So now that we have hopefully all of the definitions and everything out of the way and the motivation, what we want to do is we want to understand what controls the convergence of this topological expansion. Yeah. So uh, this has a fairly nice answer. Right? So you know, <laughs> the most useful trick in, in physics is integrating by parts. So if I, if I look at my Fourier coefficients and I just integrate by parts, I can always exchange a derivative on the effective potential with some power law suppression of the coefficients. And so if all of these derivatives exist and the function is relatively smooth, I can do this integration by parts an infinite number of times. And so these coefficients decay faster than any polynomial, they decay exponentially. So as long as this potential, as long as a, a, a function defined on the circle is smooth, its Fourier coefficients will always have exponential suppression at large L. It's just a, a generic fact about um, Fourier series. If they have a discontinuous derivative somewhere, they have some singular nature somewhere, then that gives a power law suppression at very large L. So what this is, and this is, not a statement about any particular place along the field space. 
or along the, the circle, if it has a, a discontinuous derivative anywhere, it will in bestow this algebraic decay on the Fourier coefficients. Okay. So clearly the convergence of this series, the convergence of this topological or instanton expansion is sensitive to possibly high order discontinuities in the effective potential. And those about the effective potentials non-analytic structure. Okay. So we can, we can uh, make this a bit more uh, uh, precise by complexifying the theta parameter. So we work in terms of this parameter zeta, then the axions, then the physical domain where I have physical values of the axion just corresponds to the unit circle in the theta plane. And this effective potential has some Laurent expansion, which converges in an annulus about this unit circle. And that annulus is restricted by some singularities of the effective potential. Okay. So the, the, the picture is that if I take this effective potential or the partition function as a function of theta or zeta, and I look at it in the complex plane, there's some singularities or possibly many singularities in the complex plane that, that restrict uh, where this expansion converges. And in this case, in under this mapping, the Fourier coefficients just turn into the Laurent coefficients of the effective potential. So we know that the convergence of that Laurent series is precisely determined by where these singularities get close enough, get closest. Those singularities and those non-analyticities in the effective potential determine the convergence, how quickly this, this expansion converges. So what we should imagine is that as we're losing control of the instanton expansion or this topological expansion, as we're, as the, uh, the series is, failing to converge quickly, we have these singularities that are starting to impinge upon the, the uh, physical domain, this unit circle. And because of the, the reality of the effective potential, this has some nice, and this means that the, uh, this complex extension has a nice like mirror symmetry along the, the uh, the unit circle. So all of the data out here is contained within the, the data here and vice versa. So we really only have to pay attention to what's happening outside. It's just a, a simple fact that, you know, a real Fourier coefficient has this constraint that VL is equal to V star of minus L, right? All of the data out here is contained in here as well. So these singularities, dictate how quickly these, these Fourier coefficients decay. The algebraic decay is related to uh, the order, which uh, order of derivative experiences a discontinuity. The exponential decay is determined by how close the singularity gets to the physical domain and the position of the singularity tells me what the phase of these things is. Okay. And finally, the discontinuity itself tells me the overall coefficient. So the, the main point of this section is that this topological expansion fails when the theory experiences a phase transition. It has a discontinuous derivative appearing somewhere along the axioms field space. Okay. The convergence of the Fourier series is determined by the discontinuity that is appearing in this, this function. And generally, I mean, it's, it's hard to say things, uh, uh, you know, say very specific things in full generality, but, you know, usually we think of a light 
a phase transition is occurring because there are some light states that appear in the theory. No. Um, if I think about how I get a non-analyticity in the log of the partition function, one way of getting it is by having a zero in the partition function. And uh, it, when I have a zero, it's because this energy gap has closed and has the right phase to cancel off this one. Right? So we can try and relate the convergence property of this instanton expansion to the behavior of energies, you know, energies of states in the theory through paying attention to where the effective potential has its non analyticities or the partition function has zeros or poles or so on and so forth. So this is encompassed in this, this very old uh, paper by Li and Yang, the Li and Yang or Yang Li theory of phase transitions which basically says that the way I get a phase transition in a system, the way I get a discontinuous free energy is I have some non-analyticity impinging upon the, the physical domain of the theory. And I can use that as a way of understanding where these phase transitions come from, you know, where this, these non-analyticities come from. Okay, I'll make this more precise and use this language a bit more later, but are there any questions before I move on? Okay, so the main takeaway is that the non-analytic structure of the effective potential determines the convergence properties of this Fourier expansion. So if I have a, a ill-controlled instanton expansion, I should think of there being some non-analyticity appearing in the theory. And what we wanna do is understand, can we use the behavior of that non-analyticity to find an alternative description of these potentials? Because such a uh, alternative description would be a much more useful way of, of organizing the information contained in the effective potential. And can we use that as a way of, of uh, understanding what's physically happening, like what, what physical data is governing the effective potential in that regime. Okay, so uh, I like using toy models because you, you, you can do calculations and you can understand everything exactly. Um, the toy model that I'm going to illustrate a lot of this, these properties in is this, it's just a particle on a circle in an electromagnetic field. You can think of this as mimicking um, the behavior of some gauge field coupled to uh, an axion or coupled to a theta angle plus some charge matter. The gauge field kinetic term is mimicked by the particles kinetic term the topological coupling between the theta angle and the, the gauge field is mimicked by this topological coupling. It's the magnetic field that passes through the circle. And then the charge matter, you know, the masses of quarks and all this stuff is mimicked by the potential that I can put on the circle for the gauge field. And the fact that this has instantons is mimicked by the fact that I'm putting on a circle rather than a, a, um, a, the real line. So the gauge field itself has this identification under large gauge transformations. And in this case, the particles large gauge transformations are just moving around the circle once. The nice thing about this is this is just also the, the uh, theory of some crystal, some one dimensional crystal. So we, we have a bunch of techniques to analyze this and we can really just answer any question that we want. And especially if we just put a pure cosinusoidal potential on it, then we have exact expressions in terms of Mathieu function and it's, it's great. Okay. 
So what we want to do is we want to use this model to understand these two limits, the limit where I have this very convergent instanton expansion and the, the limit where we have this very non-convergent instanton expansion. When I put a, a strong potential on top of the circle, it makes it very difficult for the particle to tunnel around. And so its instantons are very well localized. And when I make lambda very, very large, that means in that limit, I can use the dilute instanton gas. I can use this picture of computer the effective potential to get out a nice exponentially suppressed cosinusoidal thing. So in the large lambda limit, it's very hard for the particle to tunnel around. That means the instantons are very well localized. The instanton action is very large. And I have this, this limit where everything is, is very nice and, and familiar. And the other limit, if I turn off the potential, I see that I get this very cuspy behavior. The, the effective potential is just a bunch, a minimum among harmonic branches. I get a cuspy behavior of uh, theta equals pi and theta equals minus pi. And I expect that if I look at the, if I have no potential on the, the circle, it's very easy for the particle to propagate around it. You know, it can take as long as it wants. And so its instanton actions are very, very small. And that's, that's uh, a representation of the fact that this partition function, you know, the, the thermal partition function, the thing that I use to extract the vacuum energy is basically can be written in terms of a, a bunch of delocalized saddles. I get these very, very fluffy instantons. And it's not, if they take forever, it's not really an instanton, but it's a, I guess, forever on or something. It's something that just takes forever. And the instanton actions are arbitrarily small. So I find that the effective potential, because everything's Gaussian, I can just do it. I find that the effective potential has no exponential suppression at all. And from our general discussion about the polynomial decay of these Fourier coefficients, we expect that there's a discontinuous first derivative at theta equals pi or plus or minus pi because of this L squared and this minus one to the L. So these have a very uh, sharp interpretation. These, the behavior of these four coefficients have very sharp interpretation in terms of how this function behaves. And what we wanna do is we wanna understand if, well, the fact that there's a cusp here is because there's some other energy level coming down and becoming the minimum here. Can we use the properties of that energy level to describe the properties of the effective potential overall. Okay. So the general like summary of this model's behavior is that I go, as I vary lambda, I go from two different limits. In the large lambda limit, here lambda is two, so it's not super large, but um, you know, I get this very exponentially suppressed cosinusoidal potential because the instantons are very well localized and everything was fine. As I dial down the potential on the gauge field's field space, I make it very easy for the gauge field to tunnel around, its instantons start to spread out and there's a gap that closes. So as the topological expansion or the instanton expansion fails, becomes non-convergent, the effective potential becomes very cuspy and a gap closes. So what we can do is we can use our picture of what's happening in the complex plane, in the complex zeta plane, to understand like the difference be between cuspy or, and not cuspy. Not cuspy, I have these two singularities at theta equals pi, at zeta equals minus, along the zeta equals minus one, direction that are relatively far apart from the, the, uh, the unit circle, the physical domain. And then as I make the instantons more and more fluffy, the potential becomes more and more cuspy because I have these non-analyticities non that are coming in and 
uh, impinging upon the physical domain. Okay. So this is a, a simple case in which we can correct, identify where these non-analyticities are coming from. They're coming from partition function zeros when the gap, the, the difference between one energy eigenstate and the ground state is closing and having a phase that precisely cancels off this one. And because we know the exact spectrum, we uh, can solve for where this energy gap closes. We can solve for where uh, you get partition function zeros. And at finite beta, you get you know, an infinity of discretely spaced zeros. But as I start increasing beta more and more, these discrete zeros form into this density of zeros and start to uh, impinge upon the, the, the unit circle. So what we can do actually is since we know the zeros of this function and we can argue for some uh, decay properties at infinity, we can just write this function purely in terms of its zeros, right? We, we can think of these zeros as being like electromagnetic charges. cauchy riemann is like Poisson's equation. And so we can just solve Poisson's equation in terms of its Green's function and write the partition function or the log of the partition function purely in terms of where these zeros are. These zeros are determined by the properties of that closing energy gap. And so we can then use the, uh, this, this chain to rewrite the effective potential in terms of the properties of that closing energy gap, right? Because we know we can rewrite the effective potential in terms of some integral over the zero density weighted by this Green's function and that zero density is related to the properties of this energy gap as I, as I move around the, along the density, okay? So just, just to, to recap, um, if we're interested in where, what happens when an instanton expansion fails, it has a very natural interpretation in terms of the non-analyticities of the effective potential. These non-analyticities are induced by some closing energy gap. And so we can try and rewrite the effective potential in terms of the behavior of that closing energy gap. And so that gives us a way of moving away from this description in terms of instantons, these un, like weird, somewhat unphysical tunneling events into a description in terms of like something about the Hilbert space, how this theory is behaving as I, as I change this parameter and what the behavior of energy energies are. Like an energy is a well-defined thing, but a, a instanton is like, you know, it's, it's a saddle of some Euclidean path integral. So it's not really something that I can like, I can't eat an instanton, but I can take a state in the Hilbert space and eat it, right? It's, it's something that I uh, can really hold on to and it's something physical. Okay, so, uh, you know, there, there's a bunch of not, well, there's a bunch of math here, but the main point is that if we know the density of zeros, if we know that the behavior of this energy gap along where it closes, where the real part of it closes, then we can rewrite the effective potential in terms of just the behavior of that energy gap. And if we know the approximate behavior near where the energy gap fully closes, where these non-analyticities almost come in and impinge upon the physical domain, then we can find another way of describing this effective potential in terms of you know, these polylogs that give a very useful, a useful way of 
approximating this effective potential in this limit where the instanton expansion fails. When the instanton expansion was very useful, instanton actions were very large, and so we could truncate the, uh, the effective potential to a single cosine term. I only needed like two bits of data in order to describe the effective potential. In the opposite limit, when the instanton expansion fails, I need to tell you like a million Fourier coefficients. So it's just a bad description of the, the theory. But if you recognize that what's causing that failure is some non-analyticity impinging upon the physical domain, I can re-describe the effective potential fairly simply in terms of objects that know about that non-analyticity's property. And so if I know the behavior, you know, if I know a few coefficients here, then I can give a very concise description of the effective potential in terms of these polylogs. So another way of thinking about it is in the limit that the instanton expansion is great, you should use cosines. In the limit that it's not great, you should use polylogs just as a phenomenological thing. Because the limit that it's not great is that uh, you have these non-analyticities appearing and these polylogs correctly reproduce those non-analyticities. Um, sorry, John. So yeah, yeah. The, the appearance of polylog is, is universal in, in a sense that uh, it may depend on the structure of non-analyticity of a given theory. And that, I'm not sure how easy or difficult that is, for example, in 40s Young Mills theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, um, if I'm thinking about it in terms of an information theoretic like context, I need to give you an answer. I need to give you some, like, some number to put here, here, and here, right? Which is much better than asking you for a billion numbers to put yeah, in a Fourier expansion. Um, if th this is motivated by the, the, the like philosophy that if I can ask a precise physical question, maybe it's difficult to answer, but I can put it on a computer and ask what that number is. I can, I can create some path integral with some funky contour to isolate that, that number. I can compute that number uh, because it's, it's just, a, a simple amount of information. Whether or not that that is actually feasible to calculate, well, you need to know about the properties of these states. Like this is reducing, this is, this is making the problem that you have to solve more concise. Whether or not you can actually solve it is, whether you can actually calculate it is like, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a question about what theory you're actually in. But this is, this is making the stakes known rather than, you know, having to figure out what all these four equal coefficients are. Does that, does that make sense? I, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to say that, oh, this, this solves everything. It's just telling you exactly what data you actually need in order to describe this thing. Yes. Whether or not you can get it is, is a different question. Also, also, one of the related question was, um, is what, you are like posing and trying to answer uh, basically when the dilute gas approximation fails or it is actually so, somewhat different or related? It, it, it's, it's, you know, in some sense you could say that the dilute instanton gas approximation fails when the instanton expansion fails. It, it's, I'm trying to understand what happens when these periodic effective potentials no longer are very convergent? Because that right. is an interesting, yeah. Yeah, I was asking that because you are focusing on really this periodic potential of the axion as a physical object to prove when it fails and in, in what sense it fails, et cetera. But I can ask the same question, let's say, I just take the young male couple to fermions, not without a axion, and then uh, depending on the 
the size of the gauge coupling, I might have good control over the axion calculation or not. Mm -hmm. In that case, it is the toothed vertex that I have to use to probe like what happens to that, I guess. Is, is it, am I getting roughly, so, so is it qualitatively similar or in other words, would, would the uh, failure in the, in, in the toothed vertex occur for a similar reason or it can be a different physics or mathematics that governs it? Yeah, things, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I know, um, I'm not sure I, I can give a yes or no answer. Um, things change a little, the, it's certainly true that whenever you're doing these calculations with fermions or doing, you know, a, a uh, vertex, like a three point, a correlation function calculation, usually you really only have to consider like a single instanton contribution, especially in like supersymmetric theories. You, um, the effective potential is a bit special in that regard because you're really considering this like long time limit of many, many, many events. That's the thing that I'm I'm focusing on okay. and can't really say much about like these correlation function calculations. Because okay. this was the 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 question that I, I was interested in. It's like, how do I make sense of this weird limit where I have this this horde of instantons yeah. contributing? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, in some sense, this, what, we, what, we've, what I'm arguing is that um, the reason that these expansions fail for the effective potential is there's some discontinuity, there's some branch cut appearing. So you just keep track of that branch cut, the properties of that branch cut, the properties of that branch cut tend to be uh, related to simple properties about the about energy gaps in the theory. But as long as I keep track of what's the behavior of that, that branch cut, then that gives me a, a concise way of describing what the effective potential is. So, you know, in one limit, the instanton action is a good way of describing the uh, effective potential gives me a, a single number or a set of numbers that give me a lot of information about the theory and there's a precise way of calculating that and the opposite limit it's this object that determines the physics and roughly what you can you can say is that you know this this quantity where the branch cut gets close to the unit circle uh, that's where states become light. The coefficient here, the order of the singularity, is telling you how many states become light, very roughly. So, and those are like that's that's physical enough for me to be like satisfied. Like that's that's very physical language. Things are becoming light. States are becoming light. It's not instantons that are becoming whatever. So John, can I, sorry, just yeah. go back to that picture. Um, can I think of this then as integrating out those light states and generating a perturbative correction to the potential, which is your polylog or? So, so um, it's a, it's a not, yeah, it's, it, perturbative and non-perturbative is always like a little bit in the eye of the beholder, right? So mm -hmm. um, in this toy model, you know, essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to integrate out this, this heavier state. I'm trying to, I'm integrating out everything because I'm considering the effective potential, the vacuum energy of the theory. And uh, the behavior, you know, because it's not quite perturbative, but it is yeah, perturbative. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a wrong, it's a wrong word. Maybe, maybe um, not perturbative in the original degrees of freedom. Because yeah, there's no yeah. perturbative correction. But yeah. um, I mean, it looks it looks like the kind of structures you get um, in in Yang Mills like <laughs> cyber Witten theory, where uh, you might get instant on corrections at weak coupling in in the marginalized space and near one of the strong coupling singularities, you could get something that looks like more like a polylog. Yeah, yeah. Integrating yeah. Out, you know a monopole state or something or a dion yeah. state. 
Yeah, in some sense, these polylogs are just like, they're, they are functions that have a very like pure behavior. And so it's not very surprising that you see them show up very often. Like, mm. uh, it's, they're, they're these things that like, yeah, they, they just, there's a reason why they're named, you know, and there's a reason why they were introduced in like the 1800s. And they, they show up everywhere because they have this very specific behavior, um, very, very like fundamental branch cut behavior in certain directions. So I think, I, I mean, that's, that's why I would say that they show up like very often is that they kind of have to because they have this, this very pure behavior. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have a very precise reason for why they always show up or they often show up um, other than this, this picture of like being able to write down them being a natural basis for partition function zero, the density of partition function zeros and encoding behavior of that density, right? In some sense, all I did was, was assume specific, pro some general properties about the partition function and its behavior, its zeros and poles and everything. And then the relationship between the effective potential and the partition function give me a very strict relationship between the um, how those dense how those zeros and poles interact or determine the effective potential and the polylogs just kind of pop out by doing some series expansion of that density so it, it's i don't know my my gut feeling is that they just like they're like cosines and sines like they have a very they're very simple functions in some sense. And uh, it's very rare that in physics that you actually get a very complicated function. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I'm not sure how, getting probably a little bit over time. Um, so the, the picture, then that you should think of is that as I'm moving between these, a convergent instanton expansion and a poorly convergent instanton expansions that I just have these, these non-analyticities coming in. And as long as I can describe those non-analyticities, then I have a very uh, concise way of describing the effective potential. I don't need to include billions of Fourier coefficients. Um, yeah, another toy is this extra natural inflation. You don't have it really instantons. You just have fields that you're integrating out. You're generating some Casimir energy for theta, which is defined as the phase some complex scalar picks up as I move around an extra dimension. Here, it's like a perturbative effect. Like you're generating some one loop effective potential. But this also has this behavior of when I tune this mass to zero, tune the, the five dimensional mass of the complex scalar to zero, then I get this discontinuity in the third derivative of the effective potential. So the effective potential looks incredibly smooth as I tune this mass to zero, it hardly changes except the overall scaling, but it's Fourier expansion goes from a very convergent cosinusoidal expansion to a totally non-convergent one because that Fourier expansion has to re recreate this, this discontinuity in the third derivative. And it's no surprise that you get a discontinuity at uh, theta equals zero, because when I turn the mass to zero, I exactly have a field becoming massless in that limit. So in this case, I get a bunch of partition function poles along the opposite direction at where theta equals zero. And if I describe 
if I look at the density of these poles, it has a very nice form and emits a very nice decomposition, again, in terms of these polylogs. So it's a very, instead of talking about instantons, I can also talk about one loop contributions. And that's just a very general picture of what determines the properties of these periodic effective potentials. You just look for the lightest states. And if you're getting some non-convergent expansion, it's simply because you're not keeping track of the light states. You should keep track of the light states. Okay. So let me recap. Um, the question I wanted to understand is what's happening physically when we lose control over an instanton expansion? Is there a way of describing this without reference to instantons? And at least, well, I, I think the answer is yes. You know, th there's this description of the instanton expansion failing, this, these Fourier coefficients becoming non-convergent because the effective potential is becoming non-analytic somewhere. And those, those Fourier coefficients can't converge because it has to recreate that, that uh, singularity. And so whenever I have a failing instanton expansion, I should think, oh, there's some phase transition. So there's some non-analyticity appearing. And as long as I can keep track of what's happening, what's causing that non-analyticity, then I can describe the effective potential. I can describe the ground state of that theory very simply. Um, and so, yeah, the, you know, as long as you can figure out what these these Fourier coefficients, these these the behavior of the energy gap near where it closes is, you can find a alternative, concise expression for the potential that um, encodes the behavior that is governing the physics. Okay, and what we saw is that. In some, in the simple cases, the non-analyticities that were governing the behavior of the effective potential, uh, they had a fairly direct physical interpretation in terms of states becoming light, energy gaps closing, etc. In more complicated cases where you're running into strong coupling and all of this stuff, it could be that this uh, direct correspondence between states becoming light and poles and zeros developing fails, but um, this phase transition language still applies. If I have an instanton expansion failing, I have a phase transition. I can't have a phase transition with a convergent instanton expansion. If anyone has any like sources or knows of anything where uh, it goes through the analytic structure of partition functions. It'd be very interesting. I, I have not been able to find, uh, you know, general discussions about that. Um, so, um, going to end, um, just a few future questions. Uh, a lot of this was motivated by the axionic weak gravity conjecture, which was the statement that as I try and take F to be very super Planckian, I get instanton actions that get very small, and I lose control of the instanton approximation. This was supposed to introduce a bunch of jagged structure in my potential and cut down the relevant, you know, the available flat field space down to be sub Planckian so that I wouldn't have all of these very small Wilson coefficients. But we saw that, like, I can have a instant actions go to zero and still have very smooth potentials. So it's not quite clear whether quantum gravity actually forbids these very large hierarchies or very super Planckian displacements. In order to do so, you have to introduce more structure. You have to impose more things on these potentials. And it's interesting, it'd be interesting to understand whether it actually forbids them or you're just having to keep track of uh, light states. And, and this has to do with this very confusing question about instanton phases. Um, so the other question is, are like 
where do these singularities come from? Is it always the case that you have these light states or can I have these extremely strong coupling singularities or do they have different behaviors, et cetera? And a very interesting question is what happens when we have multiple axions? It's really focused on a single axion, but um, there's some interesting things that happen when you start considering higher dimensional field spaces too. So that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, John. That was really interesting and very well explained. Um, okay. Since we had a, a bunch of questions during the talk, let me stop the recording now. Uh,